I'm Shailja, a software engineer. I embraced Islam at the time of my marriage. I just have only one question which relates to humanity. Our topic is about peace to humanity. Does Islam or in anywhere in Quran is it specified about the human do organ donation? If it is so, is it allowed or like why is the reason that it is not allowed? So as I heard from some of my friends. Krishna, the question that is there any mention in the Quran that organ donation can be done or not. There's no verse in the Quran or any authentic hadith where organ transplantation, organ donation can be done or cannot done. But all the scholars have got together and there are several conferences taking place in Makkah, in Riyadh, in Malaysia. And the scholars unanimously agree that organ donation and organ transplantation can be done if three criteria are fulfilled. Number one, the person donating the organ, it should not cause a major loss to his health. I can't give my heart. If I donate my heart, I will die. But doctors say that I've got two kidneys, one kidney sufficient, and if my mother, both her kidneys have failed, I can give a kidney to her, even she will survive, and even I will survive. So point number one, the person donating the organ should not cause a major loss to his health. Point number two, the person receiving the organ should be a major benefit for his health. Point number three, it should not be for money, for economic reasons. Person can't sell his kidney. So if these three things are fulfilled, the scholars say, under these conditions, organ donation can be done, organ transplantation can be done. Hope that answers the question. Please pose your question. Yeah, my name is Amresh. I got a question. What do you think why God created us? Do you think he created us to send here for test in order to categorize us for heaven or hell? Well, that's the question. Why did God create us? And on the second day of this conference, I gave a talk on purpose of creation for about one hour, 15 minutes. I don't intend to be the lecture. One of the reasons is that God created us for the test for the hereafter. This life, as Quran says in Surah Mul, chapter 6 and verse number 2, Allazi khalaq al mawata wal hayata. He has created death and life to test which of us is good at deeds. And besides that, one of his unique creation is he created the human beings who have a free will. We can either obey Almighty God or we may disobey Almighty God. We have been given the free will. And Almighty God asked us before we came in this world, who would like to become a human being? So we opted for that. You and I, in the previous life, before we came in this world, we opted for that. So based on that, Almighty God gave us a free will. Now after we get free will, we either have the option to obey God or disobey God. If we obey God, we get Jannah. If we disobey God, then we don't get Jannah. So this life is a test for the hereafter. Other creations, angels don't have a free will. They always obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we opted for the test. We opted for the test, so we are undergoing the test. So based on this test, we will get our reward and punishment. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Dhariya, chapter 50 and verse 56, Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created jinn and the men, not but to worship me. So one of the reasons for our creation is worship. And there is a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require us to worship Him. Whether we worship Him or not, He is yet great. It will not diminish Him. It will not make Him superior. We are undergoing the test. For our benefit, we opted. It is like I opted to appear for the medical examination. I opted. So the teacher, she corrected, okay, fine. And I passed the test. So similarly, brother, we opted and we are undergoing the test. And for the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, The Purpose of Creation. Yes, brother, can we have the next question from you? Respected sir, I have four questions. First one is, brother, please, hard to believe. Please, please mention your name and one question at a time. Shijil. Uh, there are some uh, hard to believe uh, instances in any scriptures. For instance, uh, in Quran, like uh, birds dropping stones in a uh, battlefield on the enemy's uh, uh, context like that, uh, which is hard to believe. That's my first question. There's a question that certain thing mentioned in the Quran like birds dropping stones talking about Surah Fil. Surah Fil, chapter number 105. There are many things. For example, Quran says about Shakkul Qamar, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam split the moon into two. Musa Alayhi Salaam split the sea into two. These are difficult things, yes. These are known as miracles. Miracles are those things which a human mind cannot conceive how it happened. For us human beings, to make the moon into two is not possible. For us human beings to split the sea into two and have a pathway is not possible. So these are known as miracles, which only God can do, you and I cannot do. So it's difficult for us to conceive. The only way for us to testify is to go back into time. 
Here sitting now, we can go back 3,000, 4,000 years back and check up whether Musa alayhi salam, Moses did he split the sea or not. So what we say, these are miracles which doesn't allow us to go back in time. But there are many things which Quran has said which has come to today. For example, Quran speaks about science, about the Big Bang. Quran speaks the light of the moon, not its own light. Quran speaks the earth is spherical. Quran speaks the sun rotates. Which to a man, 1400 years back would sound, what is this nonsense? That the moon has its own light? That the earth is spherical? All these things about the Big Bang. But today after science has advanced, we have come to know it's a fact. But to know what happened in the past, we can't go back in time. So what my logic says, whatever the Quran has mentioned, certain things we can check up now. Certain things we can't check up. We can't go back in time. So that goes in the ambiguous lot. So what things we can check up today? Out of those things, whatever we can check up, so 80% things we can check up. So my logic says 80% of what the Quran mentioned, we can check up today and we have come to 100% correct. Whatever we can check, not even 1% is wrong. Uh, uh, most of the are historic, uh, I think so. Yes, that's what I'm telling you, brother. Uh, historic. For you to say that thing didn't happen, you can only prove by going back in time. If the Quran says Prophet Moses split the sea, you can't prove that he didn't split. Neither can you prove he split. But we can't go back in time. Can we go back 3,000, 4,000 years back? Can we go? We can't. So what we say logically, this may have happened, may not have happened. May have happened, may not have happened. The birds may have dropped stone, may not have dropped stone. Correct? What we say, this is ambiguous. If we talk about the nuclear bomb, 1,000 years back, would they have believed? Would they have believed? They would have said this is nonsense. Right or wrong? But today you and I believe or not? Because science will advance. Similarly, there's nuclear bomb, there's atom bomb. So birds dropping stones, what's the problem? It is so easy. Nuclear bomb is more difficult. So here we realize we cannot go back in time. So what my logic says, whatever we can testify today, whatever we can analyze today, out of that, 100% has been proved to be correct. 20% we can't analyze, we cannot go back. We can't go in future. We cannot prove scientifically whether there's heaven or hell. So you'll ask me, Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. How do you believe in heaven and hell? I said that goes in the 20% ambiguous lot. So my logic says when 80% what we can check today of the Quran has been 100% to be correct. Not even 0.1% is wrong. So my logic says what 20% is ambiguous, inshallah, God willing, even that will be correct. Maybe science will advance after 50 years, after 20 years. We'll come to know about life after death. We may come to know about heaven or hell. So my logic says it's a logical belief. That when not even 0.0001% has been proved wrong of the Quran, 80% is 100% correct. So my logic says, inshallah, the 20% which you can't verify by going back in time or going in future, even that inshallah will be correct. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question for brother here. Hello, I'm Ashok here. I'm doing my MA Economics in Loyola College. So my question is that in this time of, at this time of this, like uh, every world is, in a very distress, we are in a way of we want peace. Whether there is a region, whether there is a religion, peace or whatever it is, we need peace. We need some humanity, and we have lots of people from outside countries also. So, is the religion is the sole thing that we are doing so much of problems all around? Is the religion is the sole problem for that? We are demolishing the WTO all around, and we have lots of problem over there, and. Is the, is the religion is the solution for the things happening all around the world? And is it the solution for the people dying in Ethiopia? We have children dying out of hunger. Is the, solution, is the religion solution for them? What is the solution for the real thing for what we are wondering all around? Is it the religion is the only solution for what we are debating all this time? What? I think so we need Thank some you, solution for that. Thank you. That's a good question. That we are having so many problems in the world. Is religion the solution for this problem? There are so many people dying in Ethiopia. Is religion the solution? Brother, the religion which is true is the solution. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is submitting a will to Almighty God. If every human being submits a will to Almighty God, you won't have a problem in Ethiopia. Allah says in the Quran and several Sahih Hadith that the third pillar of Islam is every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% of his saving in charity. If every rich human being gives charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. Leave us at Ethiopia, there will not be a single human being anywhere in the world who will die of hunger. 
Do you know that the three richest men in the world, the three richest men in the world, their wealth is equal to 48 poorest countries GDP. Three richest men. If all of these people give zakat, it will solve the problem of the humankind. So the problem is that if every human being follows, follows the religion of submitting his will to Almighty God, like that you gave one problem. Any problem you get, Alhamdulillah, the glorious Quran has the solution to the problem. Follow the right religion and you'll get real peace. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Yeah, there's a question a from the non-Muslim sister. Assalamu when a Muslim is in a non-Muslim's house at the time of prayer, at the time of salah, can he or she do his prayer in their house? Or what is the right way to do it? And can a Muslim take prasad from the temples? So there are two questions. Number one is can a Muslim pray in the house of a non-Muslim? As long as there's nothing which is wrong in the house, as long as there's no idol in the front, as long as the place... You are praying in a clean place, you can pray any part of the world. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, I'm number one in the book of Salah, that the whole world is a mosque for the believers. So as long as the place is clean and doesn't break any rule of the Sharia, there's no idol in front, you can very well pray. Regarding taking prasad, prasad is a food which is given by the Hindus in the name of deities and gods. Allah says in the Quran in all less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145. And in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. Hurramat alaykumul maitu tu waddamu wa lahmul khanzeer. Wa ma ahilla li gairi la bi. Forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So eating prasad is haram. It's not permitted in Islam. But we know many Muslims, you know, we do not want to offend we don't want to offend our non-Muslims. So what they do, some of the Muslims, they say Bismillah and have it. So tomorrow you'll say Bismillah and have alcohol. After that you say Bismillah and have pork. Eating any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken is prohibited in Islam. How to deal with them? You can refer to my video cassette, Dawa or Destruction, which shows you a way how to convince the non-Muslim regarding the concept of Prasad and how to convince them through their scriptures about the true concept. Hope that answers the question. The next question from